Welcome back to The Brainwave. Today we're going to be talking about the plant kingdom. So, just a little bit of what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about what is a plant, what makes a plant up, what are the characteristics or qualifications for something to be considered a plant, and then we're going to dive a little bit into plant taxonomy and the naming conventions for plants. So, first off, what is a plant? A plant is just anything that photosynthesizes or makes its own food. So, plants, by definition, are photoautotrophs, meaning that they basically collect sunlight and then process that sunlight into energy. So if you look at this diagram on the bottom left, this is a basic example of how photosynthesis works. They interact with the sun, they collect light from the sun, that light then goes through what we call the light reactions, um, producing energy in their chloroplast. That's as much as you need to know right now. Another characteristic of plants is the fact that they are their growth is continuous, um, so they are primarily restricted by their environmental conditions, things like the light, the water, the nutrients, nutrients and the temperature around them in the world. Now, plants have been around for a very long time at this point, approximately 400 or 440 million years ago. And the earliest plants would have been um, evolved from algae out of the ocean. So algae would have been the first quote unquote plants, um, but they really weren't plants to start. So what basically would have happened is more life existed in the ocean and then slowly life moved onto land. Uh, so the first plants uh, would have been an ancestral green algae. That green algae slowly would have drifted onto the surface of the earth and started to interact with the surface of the earth, leading to the firm formation of the earliest plants, which have been would have been our non-vascular plants like mosses and, for and ferns. And that would have taken place about 400 million years ago. About 350 million years ago we get our first seed plants or seeded ferns um, this is when vascular structures would have started to take place uh, so these would be uh, basically so these basically would be plants that start to produce stems and have modified structures like pollen um, that are designed specifically for reproduction on the earth after that, we have the seed plants or the seeded vascular plants. And these would have been our first flowering plants about 120 million years ago. And these flowering plants now account for about two thirds of all of the extant or living species on the earth. Now, if we break it down and get more in depth on the diversity of plants on the earth, um, this is what we would call a phylogenetic tree. So how you read this is from bottom to top and left to right. So from left to right, we are basically going from later in time or in history, about 400 million years ago, to the most, most current time in history, which would be present day. And then the same thing across the top, we are reading from bottom to top in time. So closer they are to the common green algal um, ancestor, the uh, further back in time it is, as we move up in the chart, the more recently in time it is. So basically we have our common green algae ancestor down here on the bottom left. After the common green algae ancestor, ancestor we would have had the carophytes, which would have been things very similar to algae, um, not capable of supporting themselves or not having stems and leaves in the fashion that we think of. After the carophytes, we basically would have created embryo protection. Once we have embryo protection, we have um, some of the basic tenants for life on land, which would have given way to the liverworts. After the liverworts, we start to get apical growth of the apical meristem, which we'll talk about on Thursday. Um, the apical meristem would have allowed us to produce mosses and hornworts. After the mosses and the hornworts, we get vascular tissue production. These are our xylem and phloem. Phloem flows xylem only moves one direction it moves nutrients up phloem moves nutrients or water in both directions uh, with the vascular tissue that brings way uh, for the club mosses and then we have the megaphiles or the large um, organisms the megaphiles create way for the ferns the ferns after the ferns we get seed production when once we have seed production we get our two main categories of organisms that are alive today the gymnosperms and the flowering plants the gymnosperms are things like evergreens and um, cedars or conifers as we commonly call them the flowering plants are any kind of flower that um, you see out in the world. This is where the majority of our diversity on earth is right now. And these organisms also commonly produce the fruits that we would eat. So things like apples, cherries, pears, oranges, those kind of things are fruit from flowering plants um, that we now consume.
So as far as the geographic distribution of plants go, plants are basically everywhere at this point. Um, we, even some, we even have some plants, mainly like mosses or low-growing plants that can grow in tundra regions, so very cold, very barren lands. And the reason we're so interested in geographic distribution is because climate has the largest effect on plant distribution and structural adaptations. So as we look at the diversity of plants, basically what we're looking at is um, what is their climate like, and then we see that they have adapted to that climate um, to be able to survive and reproduce there. And in general, what we see is that we have more species near the equator and less near the poles. So if if you look at this diagram on the bottom right you'll notice that we have high diversity in our biomes near the equators and we have less diversity in our bi biomes um, near the poles and a biome is just a large area with specific characteristics so some examples of biomes are rainforests, deserts and tundras and in Kansas here we are in a prairie biome or a grass biome, however you want to think of it, whatever is easier for you to remember. Now this diagram is basically a diagram of plant diversity globally. So what you'll notice is we have red regions and bright regions. These bright regions are areas of high diversity, so you'll notice those are around the equator um, in South America, in Latin America or Central America, in uh, Central Africa, and then in the islands around um, the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, those kind of areas. You'll notice once we get up near the poles, like we were just talking about, we have low species diversity, but we do still have some diversity um, on both sets of poles, the North and the South Pole. And then the desert is primarily barren land um, when it comes to plants. Now, as far as plants roll in the environment, they play a very crucial part because plants are the basis of our food chain. And they are also the raw materials for many industries as well as medicines. Um, so there are entire teams of pharmacists and scientists and chemists that live in the rainforest of Central America and Africa, um, constantly just studying the diversity of plants and hoping to discover new species with medicinal benefits. Um, as far as our everyday life though, like the shirt I am wearing is partially made of cotton. Cotton is a plant that plant material makes up my material that I am wearing. Um, and that goes for everything around you. You probably have some wood in your house. That wood comes from a plant. Um, you probably have wheat or some kind of pasta or bread in your house that comes from a plant. So plants are critical for our survival um, as human beings. They are also critical for the survival of our ecosystem. If we look at this food web on the right, basically a food web tracks how energy moves through the environment. And what you'll notice is that everything connects back to this grass on the bottom. So this grass on the bottom is eaten by things like grasshoppers, mice, or rabbits. And those organisms are then eaten by something else. So the grasshopper may be eaten by a frog or a bird. The frog or the bird may be eaten by an owl or a snake. The owl or the snake may be eaten by a hawk. Okay, so energy is basically basically just moving up through the food chain and as that energy moves something else has to be consuming it and all of that started and all of that energy movement started by grass being consumed um, by some organism so plants are critical for not only our survival but for survival of the ecosystem now let's talk about plant taxonomy and plant diversity as well as how we name plants. So we go off of what's called the Linnaean classification system. So there was a scientist back in I think the 1700s, maybe the 1800s. His name was Carlisle Linnaeus. Um, and he basically created this system uh, to name and organize organisms or species. So we have a system to classify group and rank organisms into taxonomic groups and we can split them in many ways. So originally we would have done what's called morphological classifications where we would have compared this plant to that plant and said ah yes they share, they share this characteristic so they must go together. Now we're more advanced so we do phylogenetics. We're looking at like DNA and patterns in DNA and traits as well as environmental conditions and then we also can use what's called like polyphyletic or paraphyletic grouping where we group them based off of uses rather than morphology or phylogenetic slash hard science. Um, so our three primary divisions here are the thalophytes, the embryophytes, and the spermatophytes. Now, in the Linnaean classification system, we have many levels here. We have the domain, 
uh, which is the highest level. So these, are, these are things like animals, plants, and fungi. Then we have kingdoms, and the kingdoms fall within a domain. So like in animals, we would have a kingdom inside of the domain or many kingdoms within uh, that domain. Within a kingdom, we have a bunch of phyla or phylums. Uh, we have the classes inside of a phylum. We have the orders inside of a class. We have the families inside of the order. We have the genus inside of the family. We have a species inside of the genus. Okay, so basically think of like Russian nesting dolls. We have a big one on the outside and then we get smaller and smaller and smaller and more specific until we finally get to the tiniest one on the inside, which is our species. So this is the Linnaean classification system. It's been around for a couple hundred years now and it's still Still what all scientists everywhere in the world use. Now, as far as how do we name plants, we name them using what's called binomial nomenclature. So bi means two, like a bicycle has two wheels. Nome means name, so two names, and nomenclature is referring to a naming convention. So we use two-worded names to name scientific organisms, or to name organisms scientifically um, in Latin. And so this binomial nomenclature includes the genus and the species for an organism. So those are the bottom two levels here the genus and the species um, and for plants the naming of an organism is commonly based on the flowers or the reproductive parts of the plant because the flower is the part that's going to be the least influenced by the environmental conditions so like the size of the leaf or the shape of the leaf may be influenced by the environment but the flower is a hard encoded thing as well as the fruit is typically a hard encoded thing that is going to be the same everywhere in the world um, and since that that is a and that is our common practice right now because um, flowering plants make up the majority of our diversity globally. So as an example, let's look at this picture on the bottom right here. So let's say we have an elephant. An elephant we would just commonly call an elephant. But a scientist in America and a scientist in Africa may not call an elephant the same thing. So we use a scientific name, which would be Loxodonta africana. Loxodonta is the genus. So it is capitalized and italicized. And Africana is the species. Uh, Africana is italicized but lowercase. And that is the convention. So if you can write in italics, you when you write a scientific name, you capitalize the genus and you italicize it. And for the species, you leave it lowercase, but you italicize it. If you cannot italicize um, the genus and the species, then you underline both the genus and the species. Now, our first group in our plant taxonomy is the thallophytes. The thallophytes lack true roots, stems, and leaves. They do still photosynthesize, and there's approximately 10 division, divisions of algae that fall into the thallophytes. So these are the things that are closest to our um, green algae ancestors uh, that would have been the first organisms to move from ocean life onto land. Next up is our embryophytes. The embryophytes can be split into two groups, the bryophytes. The bryophytes have no vascular tissue and very simple structures. These would be things more similar to our mosses or common organisms that just grow on rocks. So this image over here on the right are some examples of bryophytes. Um, some of these we can find in Kansas. Other ones you may have to move more west into Colorado and swampy regions like on the edge of mountains and you would find more diversity of them there. For the bryophytes we have multicellular gametophytes and we have no vascular tissue but in some cases we do have specialized tissues for water and nutrient transport. Now for the vascular plants, vascular plants do have true roots as well as stems and leaves. So between the bryophytes and the vascular plants is basically when plants evolved for life on land. So they started to produce specialized structures to help them fight gravity and store water and nutrients as they adapted to life on land. And within our vascular plants, we have a lot of different groups. We have the Silotophyta, the Lycopodiophyta, the Equisito the Quisitophyta, the Rhineophyta, and then three groups make up the majority of our vegetation today. That's the Polypodiophyta, the Pinophyta, and the Magnoliophyta. For those four, first four I said, I do not expect you to know the names or be able to pronounce those. We do have the club mosses and the horsetails here. Um, the other two groups are pretty rare um, from my experience. Now for the three major groups, the ferns, the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms, I do expect you um, to at least know those names, at least know the names firms, fer, at least know the names ferns, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. Those we will talk about a lot this semester. 
Now, the spermatophyta are basically our seed plants. So the seed is a specialized structure that is basically a protected embryo that contains all the nutrients um, that an organism needs to survive and thrive and start to produce another plant. So the seed is basically the embryo. It's the baby plant that is being protected from the outside world. And these spermatophytes include the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. The gymnosperms have naked seeds, so they're more ancestral organisms. Further back in time, they evolved. Um, and they are typically woody and perennial species, mostly evergreens or conifers. And then the angiosperms sperms are protected seeds commonly they have fruit they are also flower all of our flowering species um, and the fruit is an adaptation to try to increase the transport of the seeds because an organism is going to eat the fruit the fruit will then be digested by their stomach the seeds will interact with the acid in their stomach they'll poop them out and hopefully the fruit gets pushed or transported further away from the parent um, to increase the diversity or the chance of survival of the offspring now, the angiosperms, um, within the angiosperms, we can divide them up even more into monocots and dicots, or monocotyledons and dicotyledons. Monocot, mono means one, so we're talking about one-seeded leaves, and dicot mean two, or two cotyledons. So monocots are things like bamboos, palms, grasses, lilies, orchids, and bananas. And we can see here over the right that the characteristics of the monocots are totally different than that of the dicots. Um, so the monocots are thought to be a more ancestral organism um, with more ancestral characteristics and the dicots are believed to have evolved uh, later in time. Now as far as what are we doing today to update this taxonomy and keep up to date with what's happening with our plants, um, basically we update our taxonomy using specific techniques so we can do chemical analysis of a plant composition and compare that to other plants and then decide, hey, these plants are more closely related than we previously thought. Other things we do typically include molecular biology, so like protein analysis of plants using proteomics, and we also can do DNA analysis using genetic fing fingerprinting. Um, we also could use metagenomics, which is basically I collect a bunch of plants from the environment, crush them up, and see how it goes. So in any of these cases, we're using uh, molecular biology. Over here on the right is basically our process. So we're going to design an experiment. Then we're going to prepare some samples by crushing them and extracting whatever material we need, whether it be DNA, RNA, or proteins. We're then going to separate them out and cut those bands out and send them basically for mass spectrometry, sequencing, or liquid chromatography. Then we're going to analyze our data for the protein specifically, or we'll go have the DNA or the RNA sequence. And then we validate our results and confirm those genetic sequences against other genetic sequences. And so these are our primary techniques right now. Another one that I didn't list here is the use of computers. So as you know, we're starting to enter the age of AI. Um, computer Computers are getting very advanced and are really capable of solving complex problems. Um, so one thing we can do is pattern recognition with computers. So I can hand it a leaf over here and a leaf over here, and they have very minute differences. But based on the patterns that the computer has been taught by studying the morphology or taxonomy of other organisms, it can tell us, yes, these two leaves are related, or maybe this leaf in my right hand is not as related to the leaf in the left hand, but it's more related to the leaf to my left hand than the leaf I showed it two leaves ago. Okay, um, now the problem with using computers for these kind of things is that computers still make error. They have to be trained. So the best case scenario would be that we use computers in conjunction or at the same time as molecular biology techniques and then we have a human expert like a botanist that comes around and confirms the data and then eventually that computer model would get good enough that we could cut out the molecular biology cost and sadly part of the human cost here. So that is all I had for you guys today. I hope you found this lecture interesting. If you have any suggestions or comments, please feel free to leave a comment below. Uh, thank you for your time, your energy, your effort, and I'll see you next time.